So Charles, thanks very much for joining us. Um, got with me Charles Guillaume, who is Ledger's CTO. How long have you been with Ledger? I joined Ledger five years ago. So it's, uh, it's a long time now. Uh, I'm an OG in the company. When I joined, that was a small startup. Now a, a lot of things have, have changed. What a journey. And, and your job has changed too, right? What was the job that you came in to do? Um, because I don't think it was CTO. Yeah. W when I joined, so that was a small startup. We were around 45. And uh, I really remember the day I joined. Uh, I met uh, Nicolas, who, is, who was the CTO at this time. And uh, Nicolas uh, showed me an empty room. There was nothing, like not even desks. There was nothing. And he told me, hey, uh, this is... a." Uh, uh, this is here that you have to create the security department of Ledger. I was a, a little bit surprised, to be uh, to be honest, but that was incredibly exciting to have a blank page and being able to write your own story. So yeah, at first my mission was to create the security department. So I was a, a chief security officer at first. And and that the, the security department is what is today known as the donjon, no? Exactly. Uh, we we called it the dungeon because the, this empty room is a little bit hidden. Uh, there is a uh, hidden stairs uh, who go upstairs. Uh, so that, that's why we decided to uh, call it the dungeon. And uh, this is a small group of people who are incredibly good at security, cryptography, hardware, software. And, and now they are also focusing on um, blockchain security. And so why did Ledger create the dungeon five years ago? I think that was the that was the vision of uh, Nicolas, uh, Eric, Pascal at this time. Uh, they they definitely wanted to create a security company. Like uh, the value proposition of Ledger was security, and when you uh, when you are involved in security, there was uh, something for sure. The best way to know if you product is secure is to try to break it. You have to do this again and again, and it's a never ending story. You, you have to try to break it to, and this is doing that, that you, uh, you, you are able to improve uh, the security to, to, to raise the bar for security. So the mission was uh, definitely this, trying to break the product in order to improve it. And, and I mean, first of all, I, I love this part about the company. And for listeners who haven't seen it, there's a great um, series on Ledger's YouTube called Enter the Donjon, which shows the team doing what it is they do. So we don't need to spend too much time on it here. People can can go watch that um, if they if they want to know. And I'd like to move on to you know your your current you know role as CTO uh, of Ledger. But I also I think you know what I find really interesting. First of all. In all sincerity, I, I really enjoy working with you. Like you're, it's it's. Um, I think that that the level of um, you know, technical skill is is extraordinary. But also, you're you're quite. Uh, you have you have like the users and the business in mind in 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 the way that you approach, and that's not always true with uh, with people in, in in technology, right? Some people just like to build cool things, and you know they're almost resentful of the of the commercial side of it. But I think you have a great balance of of skills and and the rest of the picture. But also the thing I find interesting, you know, I studied computer science, but I really know extremely little about you know what is your kind of core metier, as we would say here in France, um, or, you know, craft is, is what we would say in America. Um, you know, so what, tell me like, how did you come to have the, the technical skill that you have, you know, where did you study? What did you study? You know, what, what were your interests? How did you cut your teeth? Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting story. I, I think I started to get interested in this when I was 12, uh, when I got a computer, uh, the first thing I wanted to do was to try to understand how things work. I'm 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 a curious person. I want to uh, to to really understand how things work. And when you really understand how something works, you can find a way to use it in another way. Uh, this is this is what hacking is. It's thinking differently, and uh, and this is really how I am. I I really have this adversarial thinking when I really want to understand things and and try to see it another way and when you do that this is what you what we call hacking and when i was 12 so when i got a computer i i really uh, wanted to understand how this uh, machine are working how internet was working and and as soon as you have a challenge a problem to solve then hacking is the way to solve it i remember at this time uh, internet was uh, you you didn't have unlimited internet and uh, and uh, I my mother allowed me to have uh, 200 francs of internet a month, 
uh, but that, that was definitely not enough. Uh, uh, very quickly, uh, uh, in in one week, I, I was uh, I was spending this uh, 200 francs. So I had to find a way to understand how this ISP were working and if it's possible to have uh, to have internet for free. And I quickly find a way to do that. And I I, I think this this was my my first hack, like hacking my uh, internet uh, service provider in order to have uh, to have free internet. It's so funny. So, I, you know, I've heard that story more than once. Actually, Tony Fidel has a similar story. You know, he wanted to use BBSs, so that's how he became a phone freaker. I wonder how many people the telco industry made into hackers. I would love there. It seems like you could have a book just on, you know, how many hackers were created by the 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 sort of, um, you know, like overreach of uh, of telco freight, um, you know, fee models. Yeah, that's true. And and after that, I I've studied pure mathematics uh, because uh, yeah, I really like uh, mathematics. I really like abstraction, uh, like uh, thinking out the, out of the box, uh, taking a step back and trying to understand think things in an abstract way. Uh, so I really enjoy that. And at some point, I I wanted to become a, a mathematic a math- mathematician. Uh, I wanted to do uh, to do research in mathematics. Um, and at some point, I understood the system in France, especially for uh, mathematics research and so on. I, I was a little bit frustrated to to understand how uh, this system is working. So, yeah, discussing with my uh, professor, uh, they encouraged me to uh, to go to uh, to uh, computer science also, because I was also passionate uh, by computer science, but I was uh, studying mathematics. And so this is when I decided to uh, study uh, uh, computer science more uh, theoretically, because I, I, I really had a very practical um, knowledge of computer science. And, uh, and then, so I studied then uh, computer science. And when you do mathematics, computer science, and you want to uh, work in this area, cryptography is uh, is the best way because you have pure mathematics with uh, all this algebra and all this abstraction and you have computer science because at some point cryptography needs to be uh, implemented so this is uh, this is uh, how, how i decided to uh, study uh, cryptography that was uh, a little bit more than 15 years ago and at this time cryptography was a little bit dusty like uh, th- th- this was not s- something cool as it is today so it's it's crazy to to see that it became t- cool but at this time that was a little bit dusty something for mathematician guy who are working in their lab not talking to people and so on and with blockchain in in 10 years like the the field of cryptography um, did a huge uh, jump, uh, like a lot of research has been done in uh, zero knowledge, in uh, uh, multi-party computation, in uh, in um, signature scheme, uh, in post-quantum crypto, like in only 10 years, a lot of progress has, has been done in, in this area. This is, uh, this is really, really interesting. So this is what I studied. And then I worked more in security because cryptography and security uh, are not exactly the same thing. Cryptography is really something mathematical. Uh, you you write equation and you make sure that the equation allows you to encrypt, sign, and you you have all the the property you need. But when it comes to implement it, you have new challenges um, because. Your, your equation can be uh, okay, but if your implementation is not, uh, you can break uh, the security of your system, even if the equations are, are correct. So after that, I, I worked more in the, in the security area. You know, it's, I, I know exactly what you mean too, by the way. When I was studying computer science in the early 90s, you know, um, people would go talk to somebody else at the party. But even just a few years later, suddenly, you know, even just computers were something that were in the average person's life. You know, then I think what happened, you know, in, in the years since, and I'm, I'm quite a few years older than you, depending on everything's relative, um, but is that, you know, it's become much more about applied computing, right? And, and, and cryptography has become a, like an integral part of our lives. I was really surprised. I was listening to to Scott Galloway's um, podcast one day. He was talking to a Harvard dean, if I you know, recall correctly, they were talking about things like the future of education and had absolutely nothing to do with crypto. And um, Scott asked him at the end of the interview, you know, if you had, you know, one bit of advice to give, you know, a young person um, who's just entering college, what would it be? And out of nowhere, the guy said, understand cryptography. And I like, I almost fell out of my chair when I heard him say it because I, I thought, oh, wow, this is, it's, but what I realized is that's kind of like telling someone to understand the internet in, you know, 1992, 
right? Knowing that this will be an increasingly important part of our lives, you know, good advice to young people who want to be successful in the future would be to understand this quite complex thing, which is going to be, you know, is going to have a, um, you know, an increased relative importance. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, if, if you were talking to, you know, a young woman or a young man, um, you know, who was kind of ent- entering college at the moment, you know, would your advice then be similar relative to cryptography, relative to security? Like what, you know, what's an, what's the interesting field of study for tomorrow, do you think? In general, I think uh, science and technology is a very uh, promising field in general. And if you zoom in a little bit more in, uh, in technology, uh, From my perspective, there are two main revolutions ongoing. The first one is blockchain. And for blockchain, uh, there are different aspects. Cryptography is uh, a very important one, but you have also distributed system. You have have also plenty of things around uh, computer science, but cryptography is at the core of that. And there is another field which is not related, but uh, which is also which is also continuing to boom, uh, which is AI, uh, like machine learning and, and, and so on. Uh, I think we, we don't understand yet how it will uh, impact the, so- the society and, and so on. Uh, I think this is, a, this is another revolution ongoing. So I, I want to turn to the security of Ledger and, and in one second, but there's one more thing I really find fascinating that I think that, that you're both an example of and you have some insight in. And, you know, there's the joke that you, you know, you're hard pressed to find a um, crypto project anywhere in the world without French people on the team. And I think it's interesting that, you know, you were advised to go into cryptography 15 years ago. And I think that says something about where you were studying and who you were studying with. And I think is actually quite, you know, unique to the experience that you had in in university here in France. Why is it that, um, you know, cryptography and security are are a, a, a metier of France and, you know, you have so much great engineering talent from here with this skill? Uh, It's a good question. First of all, if you think about the education system in France, uh, there is something which is uh, quite um, unique. Uh, The way we are selecting students in order to to get the best student for a specific uh, specific, uh, um, uh, study, let's say, uh, we are selecting them with mathematics, like if you are good in math, you can get uh, good engineers, you, you can get uh, good high schools, you can get uh, good universities. So like we are in France, we are selecting people through mathematics. If you're not good at mathematics, uh, you, you, it's more difficult to, uh, to, 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 to get uh, good studies uh, afterwards. So this is a, this is a first reason. And so when, when, when you talk about mathematics, then uh, you, are also orienting where people are going. So, uh, like that's also why uh, France has so many uh, Fields Medal uh, in, in in the world. The Fields Medal is a Nobel Prize for mathematician, and I think uh, in, in the overall history of uh, of uh, this uh, uh, this medal, uh, we have uh, in France five mathematicians, and we are the on the podium at least, or, or maybe maybe first. So uh, France is very good at uh, at selecting. Uh, and also uh, promoting uh, mathematics. So that would be the first reason, I think. And the second one also is uh, uh, industries. Uh, it, we have plenty of uh, industries which, which were um, uh, focused on security with uh, Gemalto, Oberture, uh, Idemia, which, which are or were uh, the leaders in the world uh, in, in security. Well, and, and, and so let's come around to the, to the security of Ledger and the a nice, you know, segue there is the, is that in many ways, you know, in Ledger's founding, the realization was that this technology, which was developed in France, but used all mm-hmm. over the world, chip and pin technology, which is in everyone's credit card could be, you know, a great way to, to protect cryptocurrency as well. So the, the other thing that, that, um, we talk about at Ledger is, is, um, you know, resilience or security by design. Right. So there's an assumption kind of baked into it um, that it, you know, that, that it, you must have the, the secure design or you don't have security. So expand on that a little bit for me. What does that mean specifically in the business of Ledger? Yes, definitely. Um, so what you are referring to is smart card technology. And this technology starts to be a little old. It, it started, I think, uh, almost 40 years ago. It, it has been invented 40 years ago. But the chip we are using now are definitely very different from uh, the first version of uh, smart cards. And smart card is a very tiny chip. 
uh, where there is uh, not much uh, computation power, not much memory, uh, not much things, but it's really specialized in one thing, like security, cryptography. And from a threat model perspective, it's, uh, it's a good practice because you are splitting your application from the security part of the application. So when you think about your system and you want to make sure it's secure, you you already have a, a hardware isolation between your application and the security. And when you think about designing your system, it's really easier to think about that. You have the security on one side and you can focus on this, what are the interface, what comes in, what goes out, uh, uh, how it's implemented inside. And you can focus also on the application, but those things are uh, completely separate. So this is really a good practice. And then during these 40 years, uh, like the technology within smart cards have imp has improved a lot and the bar, the bar for security uh, has also increased a lot. And then it's a cat and mouse game where uh, attackers and evaluation laboratory are finding um, uh, better attacks and vendors need to adapt and to improve the security. And what also happened is that they have like the, the vendor, the industry uh, created um, a certification scheme. I think at first it was to uh, put a barrier of entry uh, to competitors. So uh, you, they, they created this framework uh, so that uh, if you don't have the certification, you can't sell your smart card to, uh, to banks or to uh, state for uh, IDs and so on. And this certification scheme is such that in order to get the certification, you have to go through an evaluation process uh, and to pass the bar for security. And this bar always uh, increase, or it always uh, is always better, or more difficult to, to, to reach because the evaluator, because the state of the art attacks evolve and attacks be becomes more and more um, efficient and so on. So that means that the vendor needs to, uh, to adapt and to, uh, to create more secure product. So that's why today it's Dif more than more difficult than ever uh, to, uh, to to break uh, such circuits. So we talk about the fact that there's a secure element inside of ledger devices, you, you know, and you described, you know, kind of the the model with that. But what what actually what actually makes a secure element secure compared to because there are some competitor products which don't use a secure element, um, and then you also have and maybe juxtapose that again with the the secure element that's inside of you know some cell phones, but which is also different from what's inside of a ledger device. So give us, you know, for, for someone um, who's, you know, who maybe has only a, a, you know, a surface understanding of the technology, you know, what's the difference and what's the importance for me as a consumer when I'm, you know, making a choice on which device I'm buying? So when you think about smart card technology, it's been designed for banking uh, system and also for, uh, for identity. And in this case, there are two main properties that they, they want to uh, fulfill. The first one is um, being like extraction of secrets, which are inside uh, the smart card must be very, very difficult. That means that you can give your uh, banking card to an attacker. And even with a very large amount of time, of money, of equipment, expertise, it will be extremely difficult to extract secret. So this is the first property they, they want to fulfill. And the second one is integrity. Uh, they want to make sure that the code running uh, inside the, the secure element uh, is, the, is the genuine one and it has not been tampered. So this is basically the two main properties they want to fulfill. In their case, the secret which, which is inside your inside your banking card or uh, your passport is not yours. It's the bank's one. It's the state's one, and but uh, but still they don't want you uh, to steal uh, your, your, your the, the secret inside. So we are using the same technology, but in a little bit uh, different way. Meaning that the secret that we put inside the smart card are user secret. So this is this is a big difference for uh, there. There you... comes the decentralization. I love that. By the exactly. way, I, mean, I just want to recap that for the listener. Like you know, if the you know the same technology is used to protect the secrets of banks and governments, and so if you look at passports and credit cards, there are banks and governments secrets that are that are stored there, and and they they use a, a secure element because those they want those secrets to be difficult or, or near impossible to extract. And what Ledger did was. It says, hey, we could actually use that same technology to store the secrets of individuals. So again, when you think about sort of, you know, the sovereign individual, 
and and decentralization and you think so it's interesting that the the very architecture of ledger and the way that it uses security is to protect the secrets of individuals um and it's actually using um technology that has been used to protect the secrets of banks and governments to protect the secrets of individuals. There's something that feels important about that to me in the history of humanity. So sorry, that's why I wanted to pause on it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And it's it's really uh, well uh, summarized. Uh, so we are using the same technology because it's a good technology, but we are using it in a better way. And uh, the, the security property we need to fulfill are similar, uh, meaning that uh, we want to make sure that if ever you you lose your device, it will be extremely difficult to an attacker, uh, for an attacker to extract uh, the secret, even with a lot of expertise, a lot of time, equipment and money. Uh, so, yeah, this is a, a very important uh, property. But also when you use it, uh, then the use case is a little bit different uh, from uh, when you use uh, your, your banking card. Um, most, uh, for for different reasons, uh, one of the reasons is immutability. When you do transaction with uh, your banking card, at the end, if ever something goes wrong, there is uh, there is an insurance. Uh, there is uh, you can revert transaction and so on. Uh, with blockchain, with decentralization, uh, this is not something possible. Uh, if if you do a transaction that you didn't want to. Uh, it's done. There is nothing you can do to revert. There is no centralized entity which allows you to uh, get back your money and so on. So th this is why security is even more important uh, on, on, our, on our side. So the three properties I was mentioning uh, are the first one is you want to generate your own secrets in a secure manner within an enclave. So what I call an enclave is a secure place uh, where the secrets are uh, generated. So in our case, this is the secure element uh, inside uh, our devices. So this is the first property. The second property is your secret must never leave uh, the enclave. In practice, in practice, that means that the cryptography must be implemented inside the enclave. When you sign a transaction, the computation of this digital signature must happen within the enclave. So this is what we are doing. Our operating system is implemented inside the enclave. And when you sign a transaction, this uh, signature is computed inside the enclave. In, and in our case, there is a third property uh, we want to fulfill, is a way for a user to understand in a trusted manner what he is about to do. He is about to consent for sending this amount of Bitcoin to this specific address. So this is why we have connected a screen directly uh, to uh, the secure element, because you can trust your mobile, you can trust your desktop. If ever there is a malware which uh, makes you think you are sending Bitcoin to me while the malware uh, actually uh, send it to uh, the attacker, if you don't have a trusted way to verify this, you will simply lose all your crypto. Uh, even if your secrets are uh, secured inside the smart card. So this is a, the three properties are really at the core of everything we do. And, uh, and this is our threat model, basically. If you don't lose uh, your secret, if you don't lose your backup, and if you verify um, all the time what you are doing on your device, on uh, the trusted display, you won't lose your crypto. This is a ledger promise. So I, this is great. Now, so I want to ask you, um, I want to anticipate sort of some of the questions from our, from our users and listeners. Um, I think it's great opportunity to have you here because I think, you know, the way I look at this is as a human being on planet earth, I'm going to have important digital assets in the future, right? It might be my crypto money. It might be my art collection. It might be the, the title to my car or the deed to my house. And ultimately, it will probably be my passport, right? So I have things that I just can't afford to lose. So the, the choices I make um, on how to store them are going to be incredibly important. Um, okay, so I, I, could, I could store them in a software wallet on my phone or on my computer in my browser. W why shouldn't I do that? Um, like desktop, uh, smartphone, uh, those things are really good things they are they, they have but they have been designed for performance for ux for many things but not security these are not uh, designed for security and as a developer if you want to create a secure app it's very difficult to uh, to isolate the security part of your application from the rest of your your application and 
even more difficult because you are running within a browser, which is running inside an operating system, which is running on your machine. And if that means if there is any vulnerability in this chain, this vulnerability will be able to uh, to be exploited to extract your secret. So and and today we have built very complex system. Like when you have a look on 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 the web, like what 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 is happening when you are clicking on the on Twitter or or, or, or anything is very complex. When you click on Twitter, there is if you want to understand the chain of consequences which makes you tweet, it's very, very complex. So if you want to secure such system, it's very difficult because the systems are very complex. So that's why putting secret within your browser is or your or, or the software wallet in general is is a very bad idea. And those systems are not secure because it's simply impossible to secure them. They are too complex. Okay, so dumb question. So how is it possible that I can secure a browser wallet with Ledger? Yeah, just because what I explained before, we are isolating the security part of uh, your Web3 journey from the from the rest of the journey. All the application uh, is running on your browser in Ledger Live. All the UX is, is there. But as soon as it comes to the security part, everything is isolated within this hardware device, which does only one thing, securing your secret and uh, making you aware of what you are about to consent in terms of uh, signature transaction and so on. I think that's the, that's the important bit, you know, and I want to just make sure that, that, that people really understand that. So I guess, you know, a, a software wallet, so either a software wallet on the phone or a software wallet in your browser, um, it's unsecured by Ledger, separating the, the security aspect of it, um, kind of violates all three of the, of the, the security pieces, right? Because, you know, the, the secrets are not kept somewhere, somewhere safe. Um, the, you know, I, 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 um, the, the, the computation is not done you know, somewhere safe you know, okay. and yep. I can't trust the display. And I think that's a very interesting point because people talk about, oh, well, you know, we need software wallets to scale. But the reality is, is that software wallets run on hardware in all cases. And if you don't have a trusted display, then you don't have security. Is that accurate? Yeah, totally. And when when you think like adversarial thinking, like you, uh, okay, you you will check what is, what is the attack surface what will be the easiest way to find a way to uh, to, to get access to defense and if you don't have the three properties already you have uh, you have a hole you can you can you can think directly to uh, to to this specific thing and uh, for the trusted display it's um, it's quite easy uh, you will implement a malware which makes you think uh, that uh, you have to uh, consent for receiving an, uh, an nft uh, you click on this and Actually, what you actually do is just sending all your wallet to something else. Okay, so let's look at a, another type of product. There are products uh, in the market which, you know, say they're hardware wallets, but, um, but they don't have a secure element. Um, you know, what I always say, there's some people who tell me they have a competitive wallet, and I always say to them, okay, cool. Uh, how about this? I'll trade you for 24 hours. I'll borrow yours. You borrow mine. I'll give you my ledger. You give me your other wallet. And, uh, and then we'll, you know, we'll swap back in 24 hours. No one has taken me up on that offer yet. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but to your point, you know, the reason there is because the seeds are relatively easy to extract. And, you know, in the donjon, I, I think it's worth saying you guys have cracked basically every software wallet and, and, you know, any wallet that doesn't use a secure element. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's true. So to your point about software wallet, when I started to uh, discuss with the dungeon, uh, ad, uh, asking them to uh, show, showcase to uh, to the people that it's very easy to to break a software wallet, they, they were like, "What do you want me to do?" It's it's obvious that software wallets are insecure. I just want to do a demo. <laughs> so they're like, okay, I will do a demo. So they, they did a couple of videos uh, uh, showing how to, uh, to extract and drain a, a wallet from a software wallet, but they didn't get the point at first. <laughs> so, exactly. I just want to make sure the audience understands that, that, that you know, it is, it's true that, you know, when I started in this job, Charles and I were, were trying to get the dungeon to, to show how to break software wallets and they didn't want to do it because it's too easy to do. I think that at some point you told me like, this is the job we give interns on their first day uh, in, in the dungeon. So if you want to know how easy it is to break a software wallet, it's so easy that our security team doesn't even want to talk about it. And it's the job they give to interns on their first day of the job. This is well said. Um, so first of all, what I want to say about hardware wallet is it's infinitely more secure than a software wallet. Uh, on a hardware wallet, if things are well implemented, let's say, 
if you don't have a physical access to the device, it can be extremely difficult, even impossible to extract uh, the, the, the funds from, from the wallet. This is something that we, we have to say. But when we want to compare Ledger from other hardware wallets, in terms of uh, security, physical security, as you said, you can swap your Ledger uh, against another wallet and you can sleep relatively well. I would sleep well, at least. And and when I'll tell you when we... just one one anecdotal story. My uh, I had a you know my my assistant who you know she was new on the job uh, not that many months ago, and I had left my my you know my personal Nano like in a conference room or something. And she texts me and, and, uh, and she was like, Ian, you, you left your, you left your nano. I, I'll, I'll, I've got it for you. What do you want me to do with it? And I said, Oh, just put it on my desk, which is in the open. Right. My, I don't, I don't have an office door that locks or anything. She said, really? I said, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just leave it. I'll get it tomorrow. And then I came back in and again, she was new on the job and learning ledger. And she said to me, she said, the product is really secure, isn't it? <laughs> she said, you weren't worried at all. I was like, oh no, I, I, w I wasn't worried. I'd be, I wouldn't have left like my AirPods on, on the desk, right? Because the cleaning crew will come in and sweep them up. Right. But the, I sleep fine, uh, with, with my Nano. So I, I take your point about sleeping well. And I remember like two years ago, I was in a conference and I wanted to uh, give away a, dev a device to someone and we didn't have any device anymore. So I simply gave mine. I was like, you just have to reset it and you have a device. Exactly. Like, I can yeah, yeah, do it. Well, and it's so funny because it's such a key thing for people because the first question, and it's a very natural question, people ask is, but wait, if I lose this device, I'm screwed, right? And it's like, once you understand that you're not, and once you understand, in fact, you know, you, you, there could be a reason you'd want to cross a border with only the 24 words and not the device, right? You know, only then do you kind of understand the power of, of what we're talking about here and the implications it might have, you know, on, on the future. And yeah, what I wanted to say is uh, what when we were building the dungeon, like uh, all this expertise around security, cryptography, and hardware security, especially, uh, in order to um, to make sure that we were building the right tool and so on, we started to uh, uh, to study the the hardware wallet in the competition, and this is when we started to break all of all of these uh, uh, hardware wallet just because they have they are built around a general purpose MCU. General purpose MCU uh, are great for uh, building remote controller or toaster or anything, but they are not made for security. So if you have a physical access to them it can be relatively easy to extract secret from, from, from those devices. Now, and the, the criticism, if you search on Twitter, you know, a criticism you'll find about Ledger relative to those devices also is that it's not open source. So how do you respond to, to that particular critique that, that Ledger is, is, you know, is not open source, which is not entirely true, so, uh, you know, but also there are parts that are not open source. So you know, how do you respond to the criticism? Yeah, you, you said it's not entirely too, true. I, I would say it's 95% false. <laughs> I think 95% of our code is uh, is open source. Uh, what so what this... is open source? Just for those who, who think maybe somebody's like believe the bullshit that, that idiots talk on Twitter that says Ledger is not open source. So what is yeah. open source? Open source means different things, but the, the, the first uh, property of open source is that you are sharing your uh, source code uh, to, to anyone to view it, to verify it, to audit it. But also, uh, it depends on the license. You can also provide the rights to others to use it, to build product and so on. But there, there are differences uh, for, for that. And one of the criticism we we used to have uh, on, on on this specific thing is that our operating system, the one running inside the enclave, is partly uh, partly closed source, and there is a reason for that. Uh, in the smart card world, as I, want, I was uh, mentioning uh, earlier, when you do certification, in order to get through the, the to go through this evaluation and certification, you have to. Uh, implement some uh, control of who has access to what and and confidentiality of how uh, your smart card is built is something important to uh, to to get the certification that means that for the smart card manufacturer in order to get this certification they must prove to the auditor that the way their device is built is is quite confidential they are doing this for security but also to uh, to 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 get the, to to keep their competitive advantage, and when we are working with uh, a secure element manufacturer, in our case this is uh, ST Microelectronic, we have to sign an NDA proving them that we won't reveal any kind of information 
about uh, their design. And if we would um, open source this very part of the operating system running on the on the secure element, we would reveal uh, some of the secret, uh, some of their secret source, which makes their secure element uh, secure. And we would uh, we would um, we would be in breach uh, uh, of their uh, of, the, of this NDA. So this is the, the most reason, uh, the the main reason why uh, this uh, operating system is not open source. So this is the first thing I wanted to say. And when because uh, some other um, uh, wallet manufacturer. For them, uh, I think about Trezor, for instance, uh, being open source is more important than anything. But on my side, if I have to uh, find a trade-off between uh, security and open source, for me, security is more important. Uh, like uh, I prefer having a secure device which is not completely open source rather than uh, something open source which is not completely secure. So this and, is and the... Do you think um, 100% open source and and, you know... I, I definitely consider you both a, a you know a security maximalist and a transparency maximalist. You know, knowing you knowing you personally, and so I understand the trade off that, that that you're saying there. So you know, I think that that you prefer transparency for all of the the right reasons, um, and which is why we're 95 percent open source, and you've got that five percent, which is not for the reasons that you said. Do you, and and I also understand you're doing that because you're making an important trade off, and when you're given the trade off, you choose security. Do you think that it's possible to achieve the level of security um, with 100 percent open source? And is that something that happens over time? Like, what's your opinion on where this goes? If if you build your own secure element, your own smart card, you could you could uh, you could uh, simply uh, uh, open source your operating system. First, first, it's very very difficult uh, to build uh, a secure element. You you have industry uh, which have built this expertise during forty years and thousands of people and so on. So it's very, very difficult to, to catch up. Uh, this is the, the, the first one. But the second one is also, you would like to have some, uh, if, if you are quite maximalist in, in this area uh, about, about open source and about being able to, uh, to make sure there is no backdoor uh, in the device and so on, because this is one of the reasons why we would like open source. The problem is for the, for the circuit itself, when you, when you build your, your circuit on an in an open source manner, uh, probably. The, the question is, okay, you have your GGS2, which is your source code for the circuit. You send it to, um, to the IC manufacturer and you will get back a circuit. How can you be sure there is no, like the, the match is 100%. How can you be sure the circuit is the one uh, coming from your source code? When it's completely, when it's only software, you can just uh, clone the GitHub. You can build it on your uh, machine, and you can you can verify that the software you are running is the same that you you you, you have compiled. When it's electronic, this is not possible to do that. So even if you are quite maximalist in this area, and some are trying to do that, and I think it's a good idea to try to build open source secure elements. But even if you go far in that direction, you won't have the same certainty that you have you with open source software. Interesting. It's a super interesting topic, and and you know it's an important one because it's one that, like I said, it's one that that, that we um that we hear as a, as a critique. So I want to know you know why why people, um you know should still choose Ledger, and I guess uh, there's a couple other alternatives to Ledger that I that I want to explore. Um, you know, you talked about software wallets. Software runs on hardware, and increasingly our phones, whether they're Apple phones or or Google phones or um, Samsung phones, you know, they do have secure elements in them. So why is it that these things inside of our cell phones aren't basically like a ledger inside of my phone? Isn't that what it is? I know what you mean, but as a developer, as an Android developer or a, 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 a iPhone developer, if I want to build a software wallet which would leverage the secure element inside the phone, first of all, there is a, there is an issue because you can't you can't build code within the secure element. What you have is only a set of API allowing you to discuss with the trust zone or, or the keychain uh, in, in the case of, uh, of um, iPhone. And this, so that means you, you, can, you could generate or at least store your secret within the secure element. So you would have the first property. But the problem is they don't implement like Bitcoin transaction. They don't implement... Um, Ethereum smart contract uh, interaction, they don't implement this. So as soon as you want to derive an address or 
um, um, con sign a transaction, what you would have to do as a software developer, uh, Android app developer, is to ask to this this um, this trust zone or this secure element, Keystore, to provide you the secret in the in the app which run in the in the rich operating system in the rich OS and then compute the, the the cryptography so that means that the second property is not fulfilled if you have a malware on uh, your um, iPhone or Android it just has to monitor uh, your software wallet and as soon as your software wallet will use your your private key the malware will be able to extract it so you don't have the second property and And the most difficult one, so we could say maybe in the future, uh, Android and, uh, and iOS will implement like Bitcoin transaction signature in the operating system, which will uh, uh, improve security. But even if this happens, you will still have the problem of uh, trusted display. As a user, as uh, you want to send a, a 0.1 Bitcoin to me, so you uh, you prepare your transaction in the software wallet, and then the software wallet will ask the trust the the secure element to sign it, and then you will you will, you will have a signed transaction that you, you can broadcast. The problem is, as at the moment where the secure element is signing your transaction, the, the secure element has no way to know what what you did consent. So probably you consent for sending 0.1 Bitcoin to me while the secure element is signing a transaction draining all your wallet to an attacker. So this is the third property which is missing. It's impossible to have a trusted display on Android phone or, or iPhone today. So I think this is in incredibly interesting and I, I think this is super helpful for our listeners, right? Because, you know, as a listener, you you know, lots of people will tell you like, oh, we're using the secure enclave. So therefore, and so what you're doing is you're giving people, you know, a very practical way of looking at this. You know, one, are your secrets stored somewhere where, which is incredibly difficult to extract? Two, are the computations being done inside of a, of a secure zone? And three, do you have secure display? Right. So um, if we look at, you know, in the case of a software wallet, none of the three are met um, to your point about a hardware wallet. You, you are, you know, you are segregating your, um, you know, a competitive hardware wallet. You are segregating the, the security transactions, you know, somewhere that's not your computer, therefore quite safe. But if someone has physical access to the device and it's not using a secure element, then it's likely possible to extract um, those seeds or, or, or certainly, you know, w imaginable. Um, in the case of, you know, say a phone um, that has a secure thing, it, you, you know, a secure element, perhaps you have the first thing solved, which is the seeds are, are stored in a, uh, in, a, in a secure place. The seed is, is stored in a secure place. But since you have to remove that seed, you know, and it put it basically into the clear, into the operating system to make use of it because the APIs of, of the trust zone, um, et cetera, don't, you know, don't, don't allow for cryptographic operations, you know, therefore, boom, number two is broken. And in any case, you don't have a secure display. So I think that's a super helpful framework for people to understand. And I have two things to add. The first thing is, even if there is a Strongbox on Android, which implements a secure element, like Strongbox is uh, available and only on the last version of Android. And as a software wallet developer, if I want to do a software wallet, what will I do? I will do a software wallet which runs on every single Android in the world. So I, they, they don't even use this uh, Strongbox capability because it's not supported on most phones. So today, Software wallet don't even use this capability, which would provide the first property at least. But right. they don't even use it. They don't even use it. Not, so even though it might supported. be available, it's probably not used. Or it's not used. Today. I've never seen a software wallet which which use it. And the the second thing is like security is not an all thing. This is an and thing. You need the third property. Two is not two thirds. No, two is zero. <laughs> so, so I want to, I really, I know, and I could do this all day. I, plus, by the way, I want to talk about enterprise security with you, but we don't have time today. So I think maybe we should do a separate show where we just talk about enterprise security. Uh, with pleasure. Um, I, I can, I can tell you how we build this thing. This is a long story. It'd be a good one. Yeah. Fun. Let's do that for, for the, for the, for a proper, a proper one. Um, I think, you know, I'd like to, I want to turn to Stacks because we've just announced Ledger Stacks this week. Um, and I want to talk about specifically, you know, the, the, the challenges um, uh, securing Ledger Stacks. Um, but before we do, you know, there are, there are a couple other, because there's, you know, there's a device that we can see that's coming that doesn't have a display and does have biometrics. And, you know, I'm curious, 
you know, I, I'm just personally curious, why would somebody build a hardware device that doesn't have a display, so therefore no secure display, and includes biometrics, which I know from you and other colleagues at Ledger, you wouldn't recommend. So can you, can you just speak to, you know, that, that design decision? Um, this is not my design, design decision, so I, I cannot really uh, explain it. Uh, but yeah, about biometrics, I think biometrics is an interesting technology again, but the problem is so how So when we it's... say biometrics, by the way, we're talking about a, a fingerprint or face for ID instance, or retinal yeah. ID, one of these type of things. Yeah, for instance. So, so the problem is how to use it. Like, I think like biometric is login. It's not passwords. Passwords are secrets that can be rotated. It's, it's simple. Passwords are secrets that can be rotated. Yeah, like biometrics, can, you, you can change a password. Exactly. You can't change your biometrics. <laughs> biometrics are public thing. Like uh, your face is public, your fingerprint is public, so it's not a secret, and it can't be rotated. So biometrics can be something interesting, but it can't replace secrets. Very well said. Okay, I'm I'm putting that to memory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and and what about you know the decision to have a device with no screen? Yeah, again, so the third property I mentioned uh, 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 earlier uh, still holds. If you want to um, secure, manage, and use your assets, you need this, you need these uh, three properties. And uh, the one you are referring to is is a different wallet with a different model, with a different trust model, and it's also a little bit uh, less decentralized. You, you're a little bit less autonomous uh, part of... Um, because this is also something which is very important for us. Our, we we don't we don't want users uh, to uh, have to trust us. We don't want users to need Ledger to use their device. Like if tomorrow uh, Ledger is dead for any reason or disappears uh, because there is a nuke in Paris or I don't know, if something happens, you still have your device and you are still on your own. Uh, you don't need us to operate, to manage, and to secure your your crypto. And you can, um, if you don't like our, our product anymore, you have your backup and you can recover your backup on any other device. And that's it. It's your money. It's your identity. It's your valuable. You can do whatever you want to do. We just provide you with the tools allowing you to, to be secure and to manage it uh, properly. And for if you are referring to a block, the model is very different and you have to rely and trust a little bit uh, their infrastructure. So this is also a, another difference. Got it. So in the case, in, the, in that model, if block goes away, then, then the user is not able to access their funds anymore. Yeah. And the funds are locked in the blockchain forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, I, I'm, I'm really like running up on time, but we've got a very important topic to, to finish up with here. Um, so we, we launched uh, or announced Ledger Stacks this week, a project that, that the team's been working on for about 18 months now. So, And, and really, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but architecturally, it's the same as the Ledger Nano. So from a security arch architecture perspective, it's the same as the Ledger Nano and it has one very key difference. It's got the world's first curved e-ink touchscreen. Um, so, you know, same... Uh, you know, so that, that same chip, if I'm not wrong, that, that powers the, you know, small display on the Ledger Nano has to, has to power a much more complicated display. And that's the, that's the main thing. So how did you approach that? So, you know, Tony Fidel comes in and says, we're going to make a, you know, a, a, an incredible, you know, UI on top of your security architecture. Um, you know, what, what were the, the first thoughts and how did you approach that then from a, from a security challenge perspective? Yeah. So uh, often, like security and UX, this is a this is a cursor, a cursor. This is a trade-off. And I, when the discussion started, I, I was like, "Will it be possible to drive this kind of display on a secure element?" I was uh, I was a little bit uh, unsure. Uh, so we discussed with Tony. We discussed with the teams in order to uh, to study it. But I remember that there has been a quite long period of uncertainty where. We were not sure. We didn't know if it would be possible eventually. So we we worked on that, and uh, and finally uh, we we found we found a technical way to uh, solve this challenge. Also, we wanted the the screen to be like as simple as possible. We we didn't want to to that this screen embed like. Um, uh, 
a circuit which with a firmware which uh, with uh, some logic and so on in order to uh, minimize the attack surface this was also a challenge because uh, uh, like some uh, some screen uh, embed uh, mcu which uh, with with some logic with a firmware that can be updated so we didn't want to to have this so there there was this uh, there were this kind of challenges but Finally, we succeeded to uh, to to manage it, and it it works very well. And then there there was also plenty of ideas, adding new interface uh, and so on, and it raised new security challenges. So this is where we worked with the dungeon. Like we they we we discussed about how the security architecture w- w- would 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 be, and then. We tried to break it. This is what we did because we we do that all the time. So we started with an architecture, and then we iterated because we we found some weakness, some vulnerabilities, and this is this is the iterative process which allowed us to um, to implement the UX uh, that Tony uh, and you uh, uh, had in mind. And without compromising with security, because this is our value proposition. This is what we are offering. But again, if you if your product is so secure, but the UX is so poor that no one uses it, at the end you don't solve anything. You you don't solve the problem that needs to be solved because no one will use it. So what I think we succeeded to do is to keep the same level of security while drastically improving the UX. I think probably we could do better in the in the future. It's, it's still it's still the challenge, uh, but the this situation is is really improving drastically the UX while never compromising with security. I, and I thank you. I think it's like um, to me, it's been really beautiful to watch. You know, and what I've been saying is that you know Ledger has this truly uncompromising value system around security and self custody if you look at back the last 7 years of the company there are plenty of you know there're plenty of people who wanted to say let's build a software wallet let's build a you know something centralized and it was always you know saying sort of you know no to short term you know profits and yes to you know long term security and self custody um, at the same time, you know, with Tony, you've got, uh, and Tony brought with him a number of people who had worked on the iPod, worked on the iPhone, um, and are, are equally uncompromising on user experience, right? And, and we really, I think, you know, it's a challenge to put those two worlds together. As you said, it's a cursor that, that you know, has to move. And we can't, we can't compromise on security or self-custody, and we've got to get as far as we can on, on, uh, on, on usability. I was just going to tell two anecdotes and then have you, you know, comment on them. You know, one was when, you know, we, we have the screen, uh, and they, you know, and then they're, they're giving us samples for the screen and they want to send a driver. And I just remember, I, I think it was either, I think it was you actually, it could have been Raf, but I remember, I think it was you because I can picture you very politely saying, no, thank you. We don't need the driver. And everybody went, turned their head a little bit and went, what are you talking about? You know, the, the screen company, the Apple guys, even on our side, were like, what do you mean you don't want the driver? What did you mean? Yeah, I just meant that uh, we we want to understand very well how the the screen is working and how to discuss directly with, with it. So, And this is implemented within the secure element. So within the secure element, we can talk directly uh, to the display and understand very well what's, what's going on. And there is no firmware, no logic. Everything is damn simple. And this is how you can ensure the, the security. Everything is simple. Everything is there. And, and that's it. I think in the, in the conversation, um, they said, what do you mean you don't want the driver? And you said, well, who wrote it? And they said, well, we don't really know. And I said, well, you said, well, where was it written? And they said, China, we guess. And you just said, no, thanks. I don't want it. <laughs> um, so <laughs> We'll just simply understand how this thing works and we will drive it. And, and, and that's, the, that's the thing I think that people need to appreciate about the space, about security and about Ledger. You know, we were talking to a major chip manufacturer recently, you and I. And um, they told us, you know, that they're very good at security and they have many chip offerings that are secure. And then they understood the security of Ledger and they said, wait, you secure all the way to the display? And, and you said, yes, of course, it's a necessity. And they sort of like went, wow, that's secure. Like they hadn't really <laughs> considered securing the display in the past. And I think to me, that is the thing that people need to understand is that we are, you know, entering a new, a new era, an era where, um, where digital assets are, you know, and digital asset security is actually very crucial to your life. And then I think that they assume that uh, maybe the, you know, the very smart people at, at you know, the, the makers of the devices that we have in our hands and on our desks have, have um, anticipated this revolution. But the reality is they, they haven't at all. 
and even the major chip manufacturers, you know, none of them have have uh, secured all the way all the way through to the the inputs and outputs. Yeah, but the reason why is like no one predicted this blockchain revolution. Like it's it's it was difficult to to understand at least like uh, ten years ago. Of course, even five years ago, it was very difficult to predict that this would be a very big revolution and that every single human on the planet would use digital assets and will self-custody. This was difficult to predict. Now it's quite clear, at least for me, but yeah, it, it's, it, it starts to be very clear for, for everyone. And when you really understand the purpose of blockchain, you understand that self-custody is important. And because of the immutability of blockchain and so on, like the problem of security is paramount. Like you, you, you can't compromise uh, security because there is uh, there is no possibility to revert uh, uh, a mistake. There is no uh, possibility to revert uh, an attack and so on. So that's why like security is uh, paramount and you can't compromise. I know we need to wrap up, so I'd like to to make. I find, this is really fun, by the way. I feel like I, I could go another hour as so many other, and I think that people would find it really interesting. So you and I should do this, do this more regularly for the, for the podcast audience. The, you know, I had someone recently ask me an honest question. They said, you know, are there any of the, the competitor devices that, you know, you think are, are interesting? And there, there are certainly some that are interesting for different reasons. I don't want to, you know, dismiss things out of hand, but I think sort of structurally, um, there are two things that, that I don't see any, anywhere else. Um, you know, one is the, you know, security by design without compromise, which is really what we've discussed, discussed mostly on, on, on this podcast. But there's, there's one other thing that I, I don't see anyone else, um, as advanced on as, as Ledger. And that is actually having built an operating system on top of these secure elements. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, Ledger is really the only open, um, development environment on top of, of a secure element, you know, and is that correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. I, I would like to think that uh, Ledger success is be because of security. I think it's partly the case, but it's also because of the open platform. Uh, our device embeds not a mono monolithic firmware, but an operating system. So that means that as a developer, like you have built your own blockchain, your own DAP, your own, F your own thing, and you need security. Then you can simply build the the very tiny part which implements only the security within the enclave. This is something we are providing. Like we have an open platform, open operating system, which enables anyone in the world to uh, implement your security, uh, the security part of your application within this enclave. And this is not something possible uh, in anywhere in the world. And we have the only one open operating system, especially running on the secure element, but also even on the harder wallet space, uh, this is also the case. So in, to me, this feels like the early days of computing, right? When, you know, do you have a, do you have a good, you know, is, can, can anyone build on top of your platform or not, right? I mean, if you're a monolithic system, then you might have some interesting, you know, I, I might, I might be an interesting video game console, but I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't have the kind of openness, um, you know, that, that you would need to be a full computing system. So the way I think about it is this, and, and I'm curious if, if I have this right, you know, when I, if I think about alternatives to ledger, you know, that I might choose, um, personally, I rule them out because, you know, a, they either violate one or all three of the, the, the re kind of requirements for security that you, mm -hmm. that you mentioned, you know, that we spent the majority of, of the talk talking about, or they lack that open architecture, which means the cool things that come tomorrow are probably not going to be available there, you know, for, for some period of time where they'll be built for ledger quite quickly because of the open architecture. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, it's totally accurate. And we have plenty of, uh, of people who want to build on top of Ledger and they simply do it. Uh, and then we have a security review process and we have so much request that our security review process is not, uh, is not always uh, as fast as we would like. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, this is how we build this uh, overall ecosystem. And uh, yeah, you, you want to build your own application, you just have to write your app. It's easy. Okay, one last thing. Um, Ledger Stacks is, you know, the, is all the security of Ledger with this much more beautiful display. Um, you told us, you know, that that was a challenge uh, to get to, to harden. Another anecdote I was going to tell was of um, 
uh, you know, when the dungeon, you know, started trying to break the display, I could tell that, that, you know, some of the Apple engineers were like, well, wait a minute, your guys are trying to break what we just built. And the answer was yes. It's, you know, the, the, again, I think people are like, you guys are serious about security, aren't you? It's almost always a surprise. Like, no, we're really serious about, about security. Um, but also, you know, you were talking about, you know, kind of the, the positive side of getting to that ease of use. And, and so I'm, I'm curious, I know that, you know, since, since I've joined the company and, and, you know, Ari and I are, are, you know, our, our American loud mouths, you know, we, we, uh, you know, we, we managed to, to, you know, get the word out in, in a, maybe a, a sensational way often about ledger, but I'm curious, you know, I mean, you know, how do, how do you, how do you feel about kind of, uh, you know, us becoming, you know, almost, you know, a company that's not only secure, but also important in culture. And, and I'm, I'm curious for our listeners, like from your perspective as a CTO, you know, do you find that we're like compromising on security as we're sort of becoming, you know, more of a cultural icon or are we managing to keep it in balance? I remember when, when you joined, like you, you, you were saying that your objective was to go from business to geek, from business to, to business to customer. And I was like, Ah, that's interesting. And yeah, I, I think we are still a little bit uh, business to geek because, uh, because our products are quite, uh, for techie at least. And we, and, and I really uh, think like mass adoption is something really important. Otherwise, uh, like the blockchain, uh, the blockchain revolution, the web three revolution won't happen and it needs to happen. Uh, it's, it's important. And in order to, for this revolution to happen, I think like, um, Security is paramount. Uh, it won't happen otherwise. And also, ease of use is definitely very important. And what you what you brought is to to like to to this uh, to the story is like this ease of use and the the cultural aspect of blockchain. Like uh, it's not only about cryptography. This is what I like. But this this is not about uh, only about uh, cryptography. This is about uh, different use cases. This is about storing something which is valuable for you and what is valuable for you can be art can be cryptocurrency can be identity can be access to to services can be it can be anything and uh, and this is where you you are very good at uh, sort of seeing this thing uh, on the long run thanks man I, I i love doing it we really have to do this again i you know i think you know this already i i, I tell you this at least once a month probably more often but i love working with you um, I think we're a pretty, a pretty great, a pretty great team. Um, so, and, uh, same for me, same man. for me. I learned so, so, so much from, from you. Uh, this is a great working with you as well. Nah, I've, I've learned a tremendous amount from you. We're both, you know, computer science background, but you know, different generations, different applications. And, uh, man, I, I feel, I feel super lucky to get to continue to learn. So, so thanks for, uh, Thanks for bearing with me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and thanks for being with us today. I hope it's helpful um, for the audience as well. And, you know, thanks to everything that, that you and the team did to help get Ledger Stacks out the door. I mean, honestly, especially in this last month, um, it had nothing to do with FTX, in fact. Um, but if you look at what we did on the ground as a team, you know, from firmware to Ledger Live to hardware, you know, the teams that are in Asia right now, like literally hand carrying uh, back the, the the devices for us to have at the event next week. We're recording this the week before Ledger Open happened to come out uh, the week after. Um, but man, I don't think there's any team in the world that could have done this except for except for this one. So, you know, good work, good work, you know, leading that team, man. Thank you. Yeah, we can be proud collectively, I think. All right. Thanks again. Thanks for doing this, Charles. Appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Jan. See you. This content is provided for informational purposes only and is the sole expression of our opinion and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. Do your own research. Any loss or profit is your sole responsibility. Stay safe.